Once more, it's my joy to say welcome back to all of you to the book of Genesis, the book of origins here from church in the garden. And uh, you know, the book of Genesis is not just the first book of scripture. It's really the foundation of all of scripture. It's a big book. It's 50 chapters. And we have been in here for a long time, I think 32 months altogether. The reason is because if you don't understand Genesis, we are at a serious, serious disadvantage to understanding the Bible as a unified, complete, interconnected revelation from God. Genesis is the foundation of Scripture. It is the superstructure of Scripture upon which so many other key doctrines depend. The sovereignty of God, for example, is introduced in Genesis. God is shown to be a covenant God in Genesis. We meet the Trinity in Genesis. The schemes of Satan are introduced in Genesis. The fallen nature of man is seen in Genesis. God's judgment of sin is seen in Genesis. The promise of a Savior appears in Genesis. Sovereign grace and election appear first in Genesis. Justification by faith makes its debut in Genesis. The eternal security of the believer appears in Genesis. The need for holy living begins in Genesis. The power of prayer appears in Genesis. All these biblical doctrines, they begin as buds and as seeds right here in Genesis. And just think of all the times that our Lord Jesus appears or is foreshadowed as a type in the book of Genesis. He's there meeting with Abraham. He's in Melchizedek. He's in Isaac as Isaac is laid upon the altar. He's in Joseph so many times as a type. Now consider carefully what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. He was very much talking about Genesis, the first book of the law, which he fulfilled in countless ways. My friends, there's a deadly virus that is at work. No, no, not the coronavirus. I'm talking about that virus that's been eating away at the book of Genesis, the foundation, the superstructure of the entire Bible. The virus is unbelief, unbelief concerning the book of Genesis. Those who claim to believe in Christ and say that they understand the stories of Genesis, but in their heart, they also say that they don't believe it as a historical record, as a credible record, as a literal record of real history that was prepared by Moses around 1445 BC as he was guided by the Holy Spirit and relying upon the various source documents at his disposal. I ask you, if Christ came to fulfill Genesis, how can you say that you don't believe Genesis? I say, you are mistaken, kind sir. Would the Son of God come to fulfill something that wasn't true? Our Lord treated Genesis as straightforward historical fact. And so then who are we to say, no, 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 Genesis is not history. No, 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 those are not literal days. No, no, those are, those are not real people. Those are mythological stories. I want to demonstrate this morning that as Christians, we do not have the opportunity to decide whether we believe Genesis or not. If I reject Genesis, my entire Bible falls to pieces because Genesis informs me about, and here we go, an overview of the last 32 months. Genesis informs me about the origin of the universe, the origin of order and complexity the origin of the solar system, the origin of the atmosphere and hydrosphere, the origin of life, the origin of man, the origin of woman, the origin of marriage between a man and a woman, the origin of children, male and female, the origin of evil, the origin of death, the origin of judgment upon evil, the origin of salvation by grace alone, the origin of messianic prophecy, 
the origin of language, the origin of nations, the origin of government, the origin of civilization and culture, the origin of religion, and the origin of God's chosen people, you and I, people of faith. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, otherwise known as Israel, Judah, the key tribe of Israel, the lineage through whom the Messiah came, supernaturally protected all throughout the years, and then culminating in the birth of Jesus Christ, who appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, and was taken up into glory. You know, any kind of take-it-or-leave-it approach to Genesis is a huge problem. Any erosion in the book of Genesis automatically erodes the Bible's teaching in everything that God seeks to convey to man, including the doctrine of God himself. Genesis, as I've just reviewed, explains the origins of many important things, but it never explains the origin of God. It just makes the announcement, in the beginning, God. No argument is given to prove his existence. There's no room for speculation. There's no philosophizing on how he came to be. There's not even any time to duck. It just boom, there he is, in the beginning, God. And with those first words, we are brought face to face with the God who created the universe. False religions always start with man. Human philosophies always start with man. But Genesis starts with God, with Elohim, the sovereign God of creation, first used in the first verse of the first chapter. And Yahweh, the Lord and Master, first used in chapter 2. The one who was in the beginning, the one who made all that is. One Harvard professor laid it all on the line very clearly when he wrote, Some say in the beginning God. I say in the beginning hydrogen. Well, there you have it. There's the very first reason why Genesis is so vital. And there's the inevitable decision before you and before every other human being. Choose today. Accept God as your Savior, your Father through Christ, your Redeemer, your Provider, your Strength, your Commander, your Refuge, your Healer, your Comfort, your Hiding Place, your Confidence, your Hope, your Light, your Song, your Shepherd, your Very Great Reward, your King, your Defender, your Physician, your Refiner, your Salvation, or accept Hydrogen. This is the first decision set before every thinking man and woman. G.K. Chesterton said, It is often supposed that when people stop believing in God, they believe in nothing. He continued, Alas, it is much worse than that. When they stop believing in God, they believe in anything. Which is why the book of Genesis is one of the greatest gifts our God could ever have given to mankind. With Genesis, we have an infinite, personal, powerful, loving God. Without Genesis, we only have matter, and it's matter that doesn't matter. With Genesis, we have an entire universe purposefully created, majestically sustained by an all-powerful, sovereign, and eternal God, whom we can seek and find, and know, and love. Without Genesis, we have a universe created by random chance, without any discernible purpose whatsoever, inevitably plunging man into nihilism, which is meaninglessness. With Genesis, we have man seated at the pinnacle of creation, created in the image of God, for fellowship with God, for the glory of God, Without Genesis, we have man who is the product of time and chance, the greatest fluke anyone could ever imagine. With Genesis, we have an afterlife that involves either eternal life with God forever in heaven, 
or eternal separation and banishment from God in hell, determined by our response to God here on earth. Without Genesis, we have an afterlife consisting of personal extinction for all forever. My friends, let the opening line of the book of Genesis be a majestic overture of glorious music to your ears as it is to mine. That in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Ten beautiful words, ten precise, profound, revealing words with limitless effect on every human being. Why, oh why, do not all people accept these ten words? Would you like to know? It is precisely because these ten words have limitless effect on every human being. I want you to realize that there is nothing intellectually soft or suspicious about the book of Genesis. There's no need to apologize for a single word in the book of Genesis or to put your brain in neutral when you turn to chapter 1 or chapter 50 or any chapter in between. It's not that Genesis is unreasonable in any way. Rather, it's that for many, Genesis is unacceptable. The implications are too great. The price of believing is too high. For if it is that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, then I too am a created being, and I too am accountable to him. And that's the very thing that so many refuse to do. And so it simply boils down to a matter of pride and arrogance and foolishness and vanity. For God has been clearly seen ever since the creation of the world, in all the things that have been made so that human beings are without excuse. So wrote the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1. And so we should not find it very surprising then when people who refuse to accept their position as created beings of God, under God, that they would inevitably hunt around for alternatives so that they can escape from under his rule and from, his, from responsibility to him. My friend, you can do that in exactly five seconds simply by saying these words. I don't believe Genesis. There, you're out. You can do whatever you want now. If her daddy's rich, take her out for a meal. If her daddy's poor, just do what you feel. And of course, those who want independence from God, they shall obtain independence from God when death comes, and eternal separation from him begins, and grace can no longer be found. And so we have much to celebrate this morning, for by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Hebrews 11, rejoice with me. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Psalm 19, rejoice with me that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Rejoice with me, for by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And that is why, as the great Dutch prime minister of a century ago wrote, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Mine. Mine, he cries. I am his, and he is mine. I find Herculean strength in Genesis, don't you? Can't you feel it? I find supernatural confidence in Genesis, don't you? Can you feel it? For mighty are they who believe its pages. It's like a rush of pure adrenaline. We know where we've come from. We know how we got here. We have a life that is breathed by God. We have a hope and a future. We have a purpose. We know who's watching over us. 
We know the rules. We have an appeal process. We know what to do in times of trouble. We know what to do in times of triumph. We have a story to tell to the nations. Praise the Lord for all of that. Someone said that other than Christians, there's only two kinds of people here on the earth. There are those who don't understand Genesis, and these are the disadvantaged. And there are those who understand Genesis and reject it. These are the dangerous ones. Do you want to know who said that? <laughs> that was me. <laughs> I said that. With a widespread rejection of Genesis today, these are indeed dangerous times. For in Genesis, we find the foundation of human dignity. Man made in the image of God. Priceless. Irreplaceable. Unique. But in a world where Genesis is rejected, life suddenly cheapens. Confusion takes front and center stage, and human reasoning becomes the primary actor. Human reasoning is so faulty and flawed, it eventually gets us to the place of allowing not only abortion, but infanticide and euthanasia and even ethnic cleansing and genetic manipulation and who knows what else is coming down the pike in a world that rejects Genesis. What a favor God did for unborn babies, for the handicapped, for people in palliative care, for people of every race and tribe and nation and tongue when he gave us these words. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. In Genesis, we also find the foundation of morality, good and bad, right and wrong. Morality that can only be explained by the presence of God in his unchanging, holy character. But in a world where Genesis is rejected, morality is now given a complete and total makeover, as it is right now, where right becomes wrong, and good is evil, and truth is falsehood, and beauty is ugliness, and justice is violent, and so on and so on. Without the God of Genesis, everything is up for grabs, and eventually every man will do whatever is right in his own eyes. You know, revolution and anarchy are the logical outcomes in a world without Genesis. My daughter was asking me what I was going to title this final message in the book of Genesis. And I joked with her that the title was going to be, I don't want to live in a world without Genesis. Now, I was being a little bit dramatic, but you can see the point. My brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you today to take your stand on the book of Genesis, the infallible, inerrant word of God, trustworthy and authoritative in everything that it teaches and implies. Believe wholeheartedly what Genesis says, that 6,000 years ago, give or take a few years, God created the universe and the world, and he did it in six days flat. Believe that Adam was the first man and Eve the first woman. Believe that all races on the face of the earth came from them. Believe with confidence that the global flood was real. The world of geology and the entire fossil record is on your side, as are all the so-called missing links. After all, they are missing, and they always will be missing. Believe with confidence in the Tower of Babel, where God judged the disobedience of the people by scattering them around the world. Linguists are at a loss to explain how it is that language came to be in diverse places around the world. But the Tower of Babel provides the answer. Believe in the root of personal faith that is revealed in Genesis. That Abram believed the Lord and God credited it to him as righteousness. Believe also in the culmination of personal faith revealed in Christ Jesus. 
the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 4, following up that Genesis 15 statement, the words it was credited to him were written not for Abraham alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered over to death for our sins, and was raised to life for our justification. Believe not just in the fall of creation, but let us look forward to the redemption of all things. When the curse will be removed, when there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And never forget that if God is for us, who can be against us? We have truth on our side. We have reality on our side. Now, in terms of reality, just look around us what we have. We have the superb engineering design of every living thing on earth. That's on our side as creationists. We have the irreducible complexity factor that is evident at every level of life each irreducible complexity shouting out to listening ears, creation, creation, creation. That's on our side. On our side, we have the steady stream of discoveries that undermine the billions of years that are proposed by secular men. Each one of these new discoveries causes the secularist, the evolutionist, to rewrite everything that they've done and go further and further and further out onto the limb before they're just way out there. We have on our side archaeology. The book of Genesis has never been contradicted. If it was contradicted for a little while, soon what changes is the, uh, the archaeologist changes his mind, says, no, no, actually, the scriptures were correct. We have on our side the fossil record that is only explainable by a worldwide flood. On our side, we have the evidence of the Ice Age, which naturally would follow after a global flood. On our side, we have crowds and crowds and masses of world-class scientists, both dead and alive, who happily put their trust in God's Word, in Genesis, in creation. They are on our side. And it goes on and on and on. An honest evolutionist will admit, but not to a creationist, only to other evolutionists in a very honest moment, saying that the creationists have the better arguments. They have the better evidence. So wrote one converted evolutionist. So in faith, in trust, in confidence, we stand and we declare with the saints and with the angels around the throne of God. Worthy art thou, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist, and they were created. I bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. Amen. Amen.